Listen as I read from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord, and let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. And in his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea, for the sea is his and for he has made it. And his hands have formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the, the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are his people of the pasture, the flock under his care. And this morning we want to sing this new song, Great Things. We've sung it the last uh, several weeks. Let's stand as we sing. Come, let us worship our king. Come, let us bow down at his feet. For he has done what great things. be seated. Good morning, church family. It's a pleasure to be together again this morning. We are a little closer together this morning with the overflow being closed, um, which is nice for me. I don't feel so isolated in the front row there, which is great. 
Um, but I am sorry for those of you who were a little bit shocked or didn't know where to sit this morning, but I'm glad you're in here and you got a spot. We're good. Um, we're just going to have it closed for um, because we're using that room now during the middle of the week and then as well Sunday evenings. Um, and we can fit in this room. It works well for us all to be together just in here. A couple announcements. So you may have received an email about Men's Mission 50. That is not actually on this Saturday. So that's been changed. Um, so that does not apply if you're planning to come. Like me and you already registered, um, you cannot come. There's no mission, Men's Mission 50 this Saturday. Uh, so keep an ear out for future events though. And then our adult ed classes are still on. They're running for the next five weeks. If you didn't come last week, you're still welcome to come. You're still welcome to register online for that. Um, we had a great time last week diving into some of the foundations for biblical sexuality. Um, Scott's you know, got some really good material there. So if you wanted to come to his class, there is still room. Um, even for the youth or young adults, it's a great way to be able to talk and learn from Scott um, and hear more about him and ask him questions about things you're struggling with in the area of biblical sexuality. And then Tim is running through the Psalms, so he's starting this week to dig into the Psalms more. Um, so that's directed at Psalms for those who are suffering. Um, and he's just helping us learn how to use the Psalms in our suffering and in our spiritual walk. Uh, so again, that'd be a great class to jump in on. That's tonight um, and happening for the next five weeks. Um, and then Lori's going to come up. So we had a great event on Friday. Lori will come up and share a little bit about that. You'll see a couple pictures, I think, as well. Good morning. So I wanted to give you a quick update on the harvest party. I think we need to hear from the kids first. If you were here, did you have fun? Yes. <laughs> we had a great night. Um, I just wanted to give God praise, first of all. We could really feel his presence. We knew that you as a church family have been praying for this event. Um, we were so thankful for the good weather. We were able to have a couple of our stations outside, and it was beautiful outside. And the other thing I just want to really give praise for is how many new families were, were here. I think of all the time that I have served at Emmanuel that this was the most new families I've ever seen at one event. So I want to thank you as a church family because we gave you those postcards and we asked you to invite families. And I would say you guys did amazing at that. We had about 200 people here. And it was, it was just a really great night. So I want to give thanks um, to all of our volunteers and helpers because it took a lot of people um, serving to make that all happen. Uh, special thanks to the gardeners. They brought over 48 foot bales to make our maze outside and it was amazing and that was a little bit of an effort. So thank you to the gardener family. That was, that was wonderful. Um, and just thank you again for your prayers. And I also want to just say as a church family that this is a time when we really appreciate even your financial support that went into it because we offered this as a free event. And I had a couple families who said to me that they were just thankful to come to something that, you know, everything's expensive these days. So they really appreciated bringing their family to something that wasn't hard on their pocketbook. So um, I think this was a real victory for our church family and keep praying for all these new families came out that we can continue to reach out to them. Thank you. Laura, I think the kids didn't shout because they were still tired from a late night Friday night. I know I'm still a little bit tired, but as we continue in worship, let's look to the word. Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 4 say, But now thus says Yahweh, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am Yahweh your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. Let's pray. Father, we rejoice this morning, not in man's strength, not in our power, not in our abilities, but because you are with us. Because in your kindness, in your grace, in your mercy, uh, we're precious in your eyes despite our sins. And Father, we, each of us, are facing different joys and trials each week. And you know our hearts, you know our burdens. 
and you promise that when we pass through the, those waters and those fires, you will be with us. So, Father, I ask that you would encourage us now. Would you build us up? Would you fill us with hope and strength in Christ through your word and through the songs? In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue in worship this morning, stand with us as we sing, Build My Life.
seated and at this time the children and the youth are dismissed for Sunday school. Turn with me in your Bibles please to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. We've been going through a series in the book of Genesis in the last number of weeks since the beginning of September, and now we're to that famous story of Cain and Abel, and uh, by God's grace, we're hopefully going to see some things that maybe we've never seen before in this wonderful portion of Scripture. Before we look into God's Word, we want to take a moment to gather our hearts together uh, and lift up some requests to Him in prayer. We want to remember Roxy and Gary this morning with the passing away of uh, Hazel, Roxy's mom, this past week, uh, that God would continue to comfort and strengthen them. Remember the Eaton family as well with the passing of Donna Eaton, who was a longtime member of Emmanuel. Remember to be in prayer for our uh, admin assistant, Julia. Uh, she fell and broke her, well, shattered her elbow, actually, and so she'll be looking at uh, surgery uh, this coming week, so just be in prayer for her. <laughs> you know, now there's both her and Dan out of commission, so they're going to need extra prayer uh, just to get along. And uh, pray that the surgery goes well, uh, and she's going to have some pins installed in her arms too for the next year as well as part of that surgery. So pray that uh, God will give them strength. Let's also remember our two church plants, the Cornerstone Church Plant in Hensel and Station 4 uh, near Lucan and um, Huron Park. Let's remember that God would continue to prosper their ministries and their outreach to the communities that they're in and bless them. Let's lift these requests up to God in prayer now. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and mercy. God, thank you for the beautiful weather outside, uh, the glory of the color of the leaves this year. God, thank you for these gifts that you give to us to remind us of your faithfulness, your beauty, your love to give us joy um, in your creation. God, thank you so much that you're a God who delights in these things and delights to give them to us as gifts. 
Thank you, God, for the gift of your son, Jesus, the ultimate gift to us. The life that we can have. The joy that we can have because of him. God, we look around at the beauty and the colors around us and we just appreciate them in such a deeper and fuller way when we experience them by giving thanks to you as the creator of it all. And so, Father, we thank you for Jesus giving us new life and a new appreciation for your blessing and your beauty and your wonder, giving us salvation and freedom from our sin and a clear conscience and freedom from guilt. Thank you, God. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the price that you paid in order to purchase our freedom. And oh God, we pray that as we hear your word this morning, we'd be reminded of how important it is to cultivate hearts that are grateful and thankful in all circumstances. Teach us, God, to mature spiritually, to see in every circumstance an expression of your goodness and grace to us. Lord, grant us the faith to learn, to see these things. Thank you, Lord, that through your acts of discipline towards us, you dissolve like a moth those things that we cling to and cherish above you. And so, Lord, teach us to cherish you and to love you above all else, that our hearts would be truly devoted to you and you alone. Father, we pray for um, Cornerstone and Station 4. Thank you, God, for the blessing of being able to send them out to preach your gospel um, in different uh, locations throughout this county. Father, we pray that your word would go forth in power in Hensel right now through the preaching and ministry of Pastor Aaron and his church planting team. Grant, Aaron, your words to speak this morning. And uh, we pray, Father, that your gospel would ring out in that community and that you would draw people to the church plant there, Lord, that you would draw people in from the community to hear your word preached and to hear the good news of your gospel. We pray for uh, Pastor Josh and the work that he's doing in uh, here in Park and uh, north of Lucan, and Father, we pray your blessing on that church plant, Lord. We pray that you would grant them wisdom to know how to reach out into the area surrounding them, Lord, and uh, Lord, again, you just draw people into that work, Lord, to hear your gospel proclaimed. And grant Josh just a special measure of your grace to preach your word this morning. Father, thank you for the blessing and the privilege it is to see the work of gospel proclamation be multiplied from this place uh, throughout these different church plants. And so, Lord, help us to pray regularly for them and lift them up to you. Lord, we think of Dan and Julia right now, and uh, Julia with this injury to her elbow, Father. We pray, Father, you're healing on her. We pray you guide the doctors in wisdom as they operate this week. Uh, and Father, we pray that you would bring full restoration uh, to her arm. And God, I pray for Dan. Thank you for his miraculous recovery from the snowmobile accident, Lord. And we pray, God, that you would continue uh, to knit those nerve endings together to give him renewed feeling and strength in his arms and hands and feet. and Lord, just continue to heal him, we pray, and uh, help him recover from the head injury as well. Father, cover this whole family with your favor and grace right now and provide for them. And we commit them to you, Lord. Pray you would carry them. We pray for the Eaton family. Uh, and we pray, Father, for Gary and Roxy, Lord. In the midst of their loss, Lord, we pray that you would grant them comfort and strength. Lord, we look out on our world today uh, and our hearts are burdened by the conflict and the suffering going on in so many countries around the world. Lord, it's, it's disquieting, it's troubling to see the upheaval in our world right now, but God, we know that in spite of it all, you are at work drawing people's hearts to yourself. Lord, thank you that in places like Iran that have been closed to your gospel for so long. In the, midst, in the midst of that social upheaval that's happening there now, 
there are more people coming to faith in Christ than ever in the history of this nation. Thank you, God, for how you move in places that we thought would never change. Thank you for how your gospel is going out in power in Nepal, in a country that has been closed for centuries and millennia to your gospel. Lord, now people are being saved and drawn to you. We pray for the church in Ukraine, Lord, that you would help them there to minister to the needs of those who have experienced so much loss and upheaval. God, revive your church there through this. Preserve it and keep these people, Father. Keep these believers strong in you. Provide for their needs, Lord, as they provide for the needs of the communities around them. Father, there are so many other places in this world, Lord, that are in upheaval, and we pray for your church in the midst of them. God, that you would move in a powerful way in the midst of suffering. And Lord, we pray especially for North America, God, in the midst of our security, we can become so indifferent. We can become so detached, Lord, and distracted by material comfort. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for prioritizing comfort and material things above you. God in heaven, by your grace, help us to honor you with the gifts that you've so richly provided us with and keep us from taking them for granted, we pray. Father, now we pray that you would prepare us to hear your word. Keep me, God, from saying anything that's not in keeping with your truth this morning. Help me to be a faithful steward of what you've entrusted me with. And God, may we all have hearts, responsive and humble hearts to you to put into practice the things that we hear. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter four, we're not gonna read the whole thing this morning, we'll kind of read it as we go. That'll save us a bit of time. Do you, how many of you here like murder mysteries? You kind of, you're not going to admit it because murder's bad. But, uh, you know, I'll admit that I kind of like the murder mysteries. I love British murder mysteries especially, right? Because the one thing, American murder mysteries, they tell you who did it right at the start. Like, who wants to watch that? If you know the, you know, there's no point. But British murder mysteries, you have no idea until like the last five minutes. And, and I, I, I love that kind of thing. Agatha Christie, Hercule Poirot, oh man, he's my dude, right? Not only because he has OCD, but a lot of different reasons. He's lots of fun. Um, it, and it's one of the reasons why, you know, between novels and television and, um, you know, shows of all kinds, it's, it's actually a multi-billion dollar industry. It's hard to believe, but you know, you, you kind of want, what fascinates us about murder? It's kind of a gruesome, horrible thing. Many social scientists will point to the fact that what fascinates us is people who commit murders in the sense that they're people that we don't really think would do that, right? It, it catches us off guard when we find out that it wasn't the butler, but it was, you know, the little girl who was looking after the garden, you know, in an Agatha Christie thing who, who actually did the murder. It's like, what? We just never know what goes on inside of people. And, and what's fascinating about the story before us this morning in the book of Genesis chapter 4 here is that if you were a Jew... Hearing this from Moses from the first, for the first time before they were to enter into the promised land, if you were a Jew and hearing the story for the first time, it would have been a complete shocker to find out who did it and why. They would have never seen this story coming or who did it in the end. Because remember, Cain was the firstborn. And firstborn in Hebrew culture was the one who inherited everything, was the one who 
got all of God's favor and blessing poured out on them. And you're, yeah, this is where you live. You're seeing this come and you think, oh, I know who did it. It was that able kid, the spoiled little, you know, baby. You watch it. Can't be Cain. He's, he's the guy. Well, this is what kind of, this kind of thinking sets the stage for the shocker in this particular murder mystery. So this story of Cain and Abel comes after Adam and Eve have been banished from the Garden of Eden for their rebellion against God that we looked at a couple of weeks ago in Genesis 3. And then in this new and harsh reality outside the garden, Eve soon conceives and bears a son and calls him Cain. And literally, you know, she kind of half interprets his name by saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. He praises God for this birth. And no doubt what was probably happening in her mind at this time is that she was seeing in Cain the fulfillment of the promise of a child who would crush the head of the serpent. Reverse the curse, right, that happened in chapter 3 and make everything new again. Cain literally means, I got him, right? That's, that's the idea behind the name, I got him. He's the guy. It's going to fix everything. Now look at the next birth, because what's, this is where you find out what's kind of going on in the passage. The next birth is another son by the name of Abel. And we read in verse 2, compare, now compare the wording here to, to Cain. And again, she bore his brother Abel, or Abel. Just a statement of fact. No exclamation points. But even more revealing is the meaning of the name Abel. Because if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you hear the word meaningless show up over and over. It's the same word. <laughs> Imagine being born, and your, your mom calls you meaningless. <sighs> Boy, that gives me purpose in life, man. I have none. Some of you would, you know, identify with that, no doubt. But imagine growing up with that name. Yeah, pointless. How's it going, buddy? <laughs> Bet you it's not going too good, right? Boring life. But you see, from Eve's perspective, why would she need another man? She got the man, Cain. He's the one who's going to crush the head of He's a firstborn. He's the son of promise. Let's go. We're in. Abel, eh, too bad. <laughs> yeah. Hope you can wield the pitchfork. So early on here, the stage is set for two men to grow up with two very different perspectives on life. Okay. So before we even get into our story, the writer setting the stage. One growing up with the perspective of being the promised child, the dude who had it all together right from day one, silver spoon, whole deal, and then the one who is the extra. But what comes next now is this totally unpredictable twist in the plot line. Agatha Christie, I think she drew a lot of her material from this kind of stuff. And uh, that brings us to point one, the two sons and two different offerings. And this is what we're kind of familiar with, this part. Now, Abel, we read uh, in verse 2, was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain was somebody who worked the ground. He was a farmer. Well, you can be a farmer in both cases. They're both farmers, but one farmed sheep, the other one did vegetables, I guess. In the course of time, verse 3, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And now mysteriously, the Lord had regard for Pointless and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. And at this point in the story, you would hear silence descend upon the Jewish audience 
hearing the story for the first time because like, well, didn't see that one coming. What's going on? So Cain, this firstborn son of promise, follows in his father's footsteps and becomes, you know, a, a vine dresser, a, a farmer of crops. And Abel becomes a shepherd. But in the course of time suggests these two men were in the habit of bringing offerings of thanksgiving to God. So there wouldn't have been anything strange about what they were doing up until this point. But then God mysteriously rejects Cain's offering and accepts the offering of the secondborn. This is a key part of the story. And it leads to this buildup of tension in the narrative. Like something's going clearly wrong here. Why did God reject Cain's offering? Why did Cain get so angry that it would lead him to actually murder his brother? Now, traditionally, people have suggested that it was because Abel's offering was an animal offering, right? Uh, we're assuming a sheep, who knows what it was, from his flock. Um, and that would have been more acceptable to God because it was a blood offering than Cain who just brought veggies, you know? The first vegan, there you go. You know, if you're a vegan this morning, you're in the Bible. Cain's offering, they'll often say, failed because it wasn't a blood sacrifice and only bloodshed can atone from s for sin. Of course, you'd have to read all the way into the New Testament for that. So Cain approached God with nothing to cover his guilt. And that, that's how we often explain what's going on here. But in fact, there's more going on. And it probably doesn't actually explain what's really going on here. If you read in the Old Testament, and to an Old Testament Jew, both of these offerings would have been acceptable to God. Uh, the context mentions nothing about blood sacrifice or atonement. The fact that the difference between the two offerings isn't all that obvious is actually part of the point. We're not meant to focus on what the offerings were, but instead on how they were offered. The point here is what we don't see. The point is in the heart of these two different worshipers. The clue to Cain's heart and why his offering is rejected, if you look in the text, is found by comparing the description of the two offerings. Notice, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Now, the common way of referring to a fruit or vegetable offering was first fruits, the best, the first of the crop. But here that's left out. It's just an offering of the fruit of the ground. Now, compare that now to verse 4. Look in your Bible. And Abel also brought what? Now look at the descriptor. The firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. That's French for juicy bits, right? Prime a ribeye, right? He brought the nice steak. So Cain offers some of his harvest, but Abel gave the firstborn of the flock the fat, juicy portions, the prime cuts, and in doing so, he was risking the future growth of his flock because he was killing off the prime of his breeding stock. He was laying it all on the line. So what's happening here is Cain's giving a token, but Abel gives his best. Can you see that? Um, I hope you can see that from what's happening here. You've you really got to look behind the scenes of what's going on in these guys' hearts because that's what matters to God. We can get focused on the outward stuff, but God's concerned about the heart. And the difference between these two men 
is the difference between half-hearted devotion and the true, genuine devotion that comes from a heart of faith and love for God. A hypocritical religious act versus an act of sacrificial devotion. Hebrews 11.4, in its commentary on this passage, tells us that Abel made his offering to God by faith. And it was that faith that pleased God. Let me read it. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This is what sets true people of God apart from those who fake it. God's people give their best to God by faith instead of their leftovers, the best of their time and their resources and their energy, trusting, like Abel, that God will provide. What a rebuke to our modern Christian culture, right? Especially now when we realize that it, it's George Barna, you know, years ago discovered that it's now normal for people to attend church twice a month. That's become the norm, right? Um, it's become the norm for, for people oftentimes to just give the leftovers of whatever they have to God. Check out after 55, right? <laughs> I'm retiring from life and from church. Now, the one thing we notice here is that people who just go through the outward motions and don't have that heart devotion to God hate being exposed. And, and we're going to see this as a, a pattern that goes throughout the Bible, but that begins here. The people who... Um, want to look devoted but aren't, hate having that exposed. Uh, hate having that hypocrisy exposed. We see its ultimate fulfillment in the New Testament with the uh, Pharisees, right? They, they, they worked really hard at looking good on the outside, but inside, what? They were full of dead men's bones, Jesus said. They were like a rotting grave. And when Jesus exposed them, they hated it so much that they, what, killed him. This is the beginning of that kind of story in Scripture, that pattern. And that brings us to point two, as we look now at Cain's anger and God's grace. So we read, Cain was very angry, his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you don't do well, listen, sin is crouching at your door, buddy. It is, its desire is to master you. The word desire means to master. But you, what, must rule or master it. So one or the other is going to want out here, Cain. Which is it going to be, buddy? What we read that Cain's first reaction was a physical one. He pouts. Right? He starts looking sad. You know? You know, we tell our kids, you know, turn that frown upside down. Yeah. I didn't get what I want, so I'm pouting. He was angry for being exposed, having his motives exposed, angry that Abel was accepted, and he, the promised child, the favored one, was rejected. His pride was hurt, his privilege threatened. His status called into question. But then something unexpected happens. Instead of immediate judgment by God, which he deserved, for his hypocrisy and his anger, which we know God hates, God meets him and shepherds him and gives him an opportunity to make things right. 
See, this is, this is the God of grace manifesting himself here in the text. If you do well, Cain, won't you be accepted by me? Of course you will be accepted. But if you don't do well, Cain, let me warn you, sin is crouching at your door like a lion waiting to devour you. It wants to master you, Cain. Don't let it. God graciously speaking to Cain in the middle of his stinko, childlike attitude and selfishness. Thank God. Because that could be me. It could be any one of us, couldn't it? So God says, in effect, Cain, here's the deal. Do the right thing. Just give me your best, Cain. That's all I want. I want your heart, and I want all of it, not just the leftovers. God graciously entreats Cain to repent and do the right thing, and sadly, in a giveaway to the state of Cain's heart, what happens? Cain, in his pride, rejects God's grace. We all know the rest of the story, right? Verses 8 to 10, grace is rejected, and then premeditated murder is embraced. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. He does it out in the field, right? Because in the Old Testament, as the idea of premeditated murder develops, we find out that pre, one of the prerequisites for premeditation in Leviticus is that it happen where nobody's around. And one of the ways of establishing the basis of premeditation is where it happens. And so interestingly, the author here places it out in the field. Cain rises up against his brother Abel and kills him. Then the Lord says to Cain, you know, he likes asking questions, right? Kind of like Adam, where are you? Cain, where's your brother? It's not where are you, where's your brother? And he says, I don't know. You can hear the cheekiness here, right? Am I my brother's keeper? Well, you should know that, Cain. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the Adam, the, the soil in which it came. And when we reject God's grace and our pride, we stand alone against this monster of sin. And we have no hope of winning. Cain leads Abel into the field and he kills him. And, you know, we're not talking about, I shot you at 600 yards with a gun and I was completely removed. This is a kind of eye-to-eye, face-to-face type of murder. Did he kill him with the same knife that Abel used to sacrifice his animal with? Did he choke him to death? Did he smack him on the head with a rock? This is, this is not just some kind of arm's length murder. This is, I'm right in front of you, my brother, and I'm killing you. The Hebrew word actually here for killed is the same word that's used throughout the rest of the Old Testament for premeditated murder. So then the question is, why would he intentionally kill his brother? Because he hated him? Well, yes and no. The Apostle John in the New Testament reminds us that wholehearted worship of God changes how we treat one another. In John 1 John 3, this is the message that we've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was an evil one, of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil, and his brothers were righteous. One theologian writes in this regard, what happened back in Genesis 4 was the beginning of every church split, every act of persecution, every word of gossip, and every tactic for undermining a devoted Christian. True devotion exposes hypocrisy and fans the flames of jealousy and anger in those who are exposed. And so yes, Cain killed Abel because he hated him. He hated his sincerity and how it exposed his own hypocrisy. But just as significantly here, Cain killed Abel because deep down he hated God 
He had marginalized God and pushed him to the periphery of his life to the point where he goes through the motions of bringing an offering, but his heart's not in it. And that is the beginning of this descent into man-hatred and man-murder. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once wrote, murder is hatred to God for making somebody else who offends us. David recognized this in his great psalm of repentance in Psalm 51.4 when he sang in prayer to God against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, O Lord. David knew deep down that his murder of Bathsheba's husband was a sin against God first and foremost. We do that, don't we? We love misdirecting our anger. We would never say we're mad at God for anything. But we kill people in our own minds by our hate, hateful thoughts. We turn on people we love because we can actually see them. And if not murder them, we try to destroy them with our words and make them hurt like we hurt. May God grant us the grace to turn to God with our pain and allow him to bring healing as we humble, humbly repent of our sin. And finally, for the sake of time, we come to Cain's judgment. I mean, we could spend a lot more time on that one, but we'll talk about Cain's judgment and God's grace. God says to Cain, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, verse 10. And now you're cursed from the ground, which has opened up its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, Cain, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Then Cain says to the Lord in a whiny voice, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Not a word of repentance, regret, sorrow over what he did. It's just, my life's going to get hard. Yeah, welcome to the real world. But listen to what God says to him. Verse 15, the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. That is God here using the sevenfold thing to emphasize a complete vengeance on his part for somebody who would take that into their own hands to kill Cain. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. One of the main themes of this final section, this epilogue to the story of Cain and Abel, that comes out over and over here is this idea of alienation. Cain alienated himself from his brother by hatred and murder and alienated himself from his family. But ultimately, he alienated himself from God. First by his indifference and then by his refusal to repent when God graciously, mercifully exposes his heart. And so now, God proceeds to alienate Cain from the very soil that he would look to for his substance. He becomes a wanderer with no place to call home. He settles in this place called Nod, which means wandering. Right? So the wanderer in wandering, as if we don't get the first part. We need to hear it again. He's wandering. He has nowhere to settle, nowhere to call home. Nowhere to be secure. And you know, what a powerful picture of what sin does to us, right? This is what sin does to all of humanity. It turns us all into a bunch of wanderers, a bunch of lost sheep, like Jesus described, right? We become alienated from God, and then, first thing you know, we're alienated from one another and alone, without hope without friends, and without God in the world. 
That's what it says in Ephesians 2.12. Paul says, remember. And he was talking to Christians, and he said, remember what life was like, guys, when you were out there, when you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel or the people of God, strangers to God's covenant of love and his promise to deliver you, having no hope and without God in the world. And you know, there's no sadder statement, I think, in all of Scripture. No hope and no God. Cain is an emblem of all humanity, isn't he? As we stand separated from Christ because of our sin and our need of forgiveness and grace. We're all living east of Eden, right? The moment we're born into this world, that's how we're born. We're born living east of Eden in this this place of alienation from God. Removed from his blessing. Removed from intimacy with him and sometimes removed from the ability to even be close to those around us that we love. But again, we're minded of God's grace in the midst of all this. In spite of Cain's self-pity and refusal to repent, God marks him to ensure that he's able to live out his life even though he deserved death. But isn't that all our stories? We're rebellious against God, self-focused, sinful from birth, refusing to repent, but God. I'm so thankful to God for that portion of Scripture in Ephesians 2.4 where it says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, even when we were out there alienated from him, living east of Eden without hope and without God, God steps into our brokenness and makes us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. Hallelujah. The takeaway in the New Testament, don't be like Cain. That's yeah, what it says over and over in the New Testament. Whenever this story comes up and is used as an illustration, yeah, don't be like Cain. By your unbelief, by your hypocrisy, by trying to fake Christianity, by doing all the outward things but not looking on your hearts. Offering a pittance to God, thinking that he should just be happy that you're here instead of offering your best to him by faith. And secondly, we learn from this that nobody gets away with anything, man. Cain thought he was out in the middle of a field. Nobody's going to see me. I can bump him off, you know. Say a lion got him, right? Like Joseph's brothers, you know, tear up his shirt, put blood all over it. (laughs) Man, sorry. But God always knows. And there's coming a judgment where God will expose every sin. And listen to me. Take this to heart this morning. You will perish in your sin unless you repent and receive Christ's offer of forgiveness by faith. Make no mistake. Nobody's going to get away with anything. And that, that ought to be a comfort because some people shouldn't be getting away with anything. But we're all in the same boat. right? We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory and need to be forgiven and restored by faith in Christ. And if you haven't repented this morning, if you haven't come to that place where Cain had to face, right? If you haven't come to that place where you've had your sin exposed, and maybe you're feeling a little, (laughs) Pastor Tim, can you shut up now? If that's how you're feeling, listen, it's not from me. That's God convicting you of your sin and your need to repent. Listen to him. Listen to him now before you perish. Because once you're dead, you don't get a sick and kick at the can. Your opportunity is here in this life now. And this might be the only time you ever hear this gospel of good news. Respond to it now. Because you might not get another chance. Don't be like Cain. Entertaining jealousy and anger in your heart. It will master you in the end if you don't repent. Notice how subtly Cain's downfall happened here. 
It started with indifference to God instead of profound gratitude. You know, I always say it, but it always comes back to that gratitude thing, right? We need to be so aware of how we can take everything around us for granted. And ingratitude can start to work its way in and indifference comes with it. And instead of seeking God with all of our hearts, we kind of drift in and out. Listen, brothers and sisters, the one thing this story reminds us is that sin is crouching at every one of our doors. Desiring at every moment to want to master us. Because we're all living east of Eden. May God grant us grace to humbly respond to him this morning by anew and afresh confessing our cold-heartedness and our tendency to just be distracted and drift into indifference and instead turn to him with a renewed devotion of heart, a heart that's overflowing in gratitude for all that he's done for us in Jesus. That's why, you know, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves over and over and to be reminded of what Christ has done for us to stir up in our hearts a renewed gratitude for his grace. I need it. I need it every single morning. I need it in the afternoon, and I need it at night because my natural tendency is to drift into ingratitude and start looking around me and going, I need more. What a jerk, you know? I do. I, I look at that and think, what a stinking jerk I am. What do you mean I need more? I've got it all. And then some. But that's that's how we're wired, right? There's something deep down in us that just wants more all the time. And the reminder of the gospel is we have it all in Christ. And may God grant us grace to remember that this morning and not walk in the way of Cain. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these truths. And we ask that in your mercy, you would enable us, Father, to be self-aware, aware of our tendency to drift into ingratitude and indifference and walk in the way of Cain. Father, remind us daily that sin is crouching at our door and the only way to turn away from it is to have humble, soft hearts that are willing to repent and turn to you and look to you for grace and strength to help us in our time of need. And so Lord, we commit this to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing this morning, let's stand as we sing, Take My Life, Take My Life. And uh, as we sing this song this morning, let's sing it as a prayer to him this morning.
benediction this morning. Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Go in peace.